Hey guys, it's Merce. Welcome back to Harpies in the Trees, where I review horror books with a supernatural focus. So today's video was supposed to be The Exorcist by William Paul Bloody and The Blackstone Chronicles by John Saul. However, I didn't finish The Blackstone Chronicles. I'm still reading it. I just kind of wasn't feeling it at the moment. Like I kind of just wanted something a little bit different. So I decided to pick up Frozen Charlotte, and so this will be the review for today. You guys seem to really like it when I do some research and find the supernatural releases that will be coming up. The latest video I did for that was the second video I did for those type of release things. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue to do those every month. So the next one I will be doing is for March and April. It's actually pretty fun and I like just kind of hunting for stuff and seeing what's out there and you know, just all of the potential, you know, it's just like really exciting. So I will keep doing those every month and add that to my uh, monthly video uh, circulation, I guess. <laughs> And you guys actually had some really cool comments about um, some of the books that I was talking about, especially relating them to movies, which I thought was really cool. So let's talk about those. So quite a few of you compared The Devil House by John Darnielle with the movie Sinister, which I thought was pretty interesting. And another commenter thought that The Devil House was kind of a mix of Sinister and the Amityville Horror. Carly Rinaldi says, Hold My Place reminds me of Crimson Peak. It's almost kind of exactly the same story, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Two commenters were comparing uh, the book of the most precious substance um, as reminding them a little bit of The Ninth Gate. And for one commenter, um, they also thought a little bit of eyes wide shut in there too. And last but not least, there was a comment about Dead Silence, which sounds really cool to me and I'm very excited about it because I think that horror sci-fi is kind of hard to come across. So they recommended this book called The Ghost Line by Andrew Neil Gray and J.S. Herbison. So if you like The Sound of Dead Silence or you're looking for something kind of in that kind of realm of like, you know, ships that have disappeared uh, in space. This sounds really cool. I've added it to my Goodreads, so I definitely want to get that. Um, but I just hope that these books, I hope, you know, that all of them are potentially really good reads. Um, and I'm very excited to be picking up some of them soon, I hope. And by the way, the What We Love in Horror video, community video, um, is coming up soon. I, I will be working on it. Um, so. Don't worry, I did forget about it. It's in the works. So thank you guys so much for commenting. That was really cool. Now let's get to the book review. This story is about Sophie. She's a teenager. Um, she has a pretty normal life until her best friend dies from a kind of freak accident. They were at a diner. It's like part of their ritual. They go to the diner and they just share an order of fries together until her best friend Jay takes out his phone and opens up an app. And it's a app for a Ouija board game. As soon as they begin to interact with the app, things begin to happen in the diner and it is complete mayhem. And it's after this when her best friend dies. Sophie is completely devastated by this loss, but she keeps replaying the event over and over again in her mind, what the Ouija board had said, what they asked of it, what, what she felt, because she had actually felt something that was unexplainable in the diner. She felt someone holding her hand, but it wasn't Jay. She gets this idea that she needs to go and see her distant cousins that she hasn't seen in years. She feels like there might be some connection here. She realizes that she doesn't really know her cousins that much anymore, and they are very uh, unique. <laughs> and they live in a very interesting place. It's actually an old school or old boarding home. This is where Sophie ends up trying to solve this equation of what happened. To Jay. So before I do my review for Frozen Charlotte, let me tell you a little bit about the urban legend um, that Frozen Charlotte is. In the 1850s or the 1860s in the United States, there was a 
printed like obituary or printed information in the newspaper about a young woman who died by freezing to death on her way to a ball. Once this came out into the newspapers, people were making songs about it, <laughs> singing about it. It became really, really popular because of just how uh, macabre and sad it was. So at some point, there are these little figurines that are created. They can be, you know, from this big to, you know, a little bigger, but they were these porcelain molds, basically. But uh, anyway, you would get these little frozen Charlotte toys, which were super cheap, so they're very popular, and little girls could dress them up and um, give them clothes and stuff. One of the lessons of frozen Charlotte was listen to your parents, you know when we tell you to wear a coat or to have a blanket or something because it is too cold, you need to listen or you're gonna end up like frozen Charlotte. So in this story, there are frozen Charlottes and in this version of the frozen Charlottes, they are, they're very different. They are very uh, sinister, let's say. When, so when Sophie goes to visit her cousins and they're all characters, like they're, they're just all of these kind of like weird, characters um, in a good way where, where you're just like, what's their deal? Like, what's their problem? And of course, you know, there's a lot of secrets and there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of things to maneuver. So that was what was really fun. It was just kind of trying to figure out what's happening, you know, who, what type of people these, you know, they are, are they good? Are they bad? Are they malicious? Are they not? Um, and this, you know, the story of the boarding house goes back, you know, to like 18 something, 1850s, 1860s or so. There's also a little town that, you know, Sophie visits to try and get more information. There's a lot of cool stuff. It's definitely the tension is very high between the characters, which was awesome. Um, and then we have this supernatural aspect of these frozen Charlottes who were definitely creepy and eerie. Um, I really, I really liked it. I, I know that like, if I had read this book at like 14, oh my God, this would have been, oh, it would have been heaven for me. <laughs> I also like the villain in this book. It's just, <laughs> I can't tell you anything about it, but let's just say like, it's done really, really well and you just want to, oh! And there were definitely things that just kind of had me guessing. Um, so. I love that. So I had a lot of fun with it. Um, the Ouija app that I talked about in the beginning, I thought was actually pretty cool. A lot of the times technology can be a little cheesy when you're trying to integrate it into horror, but it worked really well here. It was like believable, or maybe it was like more like, it was convincing, you know? So this was just so much fun. There's really not much else to say about it. This is a series, so I'm definitely gonna get the rest of the series. So obviously The Exorcist is super famous and you probably know the story already, but for those of you who don't know it, I'll try to break it down pretty quickly. This is about a young girl who becomes possessed. Her mother is trying to do everything she can to help her by taking her to doctors and hospitals, but none of it is working and she's just progressively getting worse and worse. Um, she is able to find the help of a priest who comes to her aid willingly and wants to attempt to help this girl. It becomes this huge spiritual and physical and mental battle. So this book was written in the 1970s. Um, I don't think uh, possession was really that popular amongst like mainstream people. Like probably most people didn't really know what it was, what it meant to be possessed, what an exorcist was. They probably didn't know. So this book and the film probably blew so many minds. Um, but it's written so well because Blatty took the time to research uh, just so much. I mean, he didn't only just research like what demons are and what they're like. And he also researched, you know, like what priests do and, and you know what they go through, um, the history of exorcism, what they historically do during a possession. What does it really look like when you're possessed? So he, he did a lot of research. So 
The story is very convincing and believable because it's, he's pulling all these things from just real world um, information or backgrounds. So that was really good. Encounters with the demon, where he's kind of talking back and forth um, like this. Your nomen mehi est, he asked quickly. What is my name? Karas. And now the priest rushed on with excitement. Ubisum, where am I? In Kukukulu. In a room. At Ubi es Kabukulum. And where is the room? In Doma. Mortus. He is dead. Homudo mortus est. How did he die? In Ventus es capite reverso. He was found with his head turned around. Ah, uh, well. That's sufficient excitement for now, said the demon with a grin. Yes, sufficient altogether, I would think. Though, of course, it will occur to you, I suppose. I mean, you being you. That's why you are asking your questions in Latin. You are mentally formulating answers. In Latin. It laughed. <laughs> All unconscious, of course. Yes. Whatever would we do without our unconsciousness, Karas? Do you see what I'm driving at? I cannot speak Latin at all. I read your mind. I merely plucked the responses from your head. It was really cool. You really felt like they were having a conversation, but the conversation was was a game. Really fascinating. And I enjoyed so much how Bloody did not hold back. Like he didn't hold the demon back from seeing horrible things that you figure a demon would say. Like they were shocking. <laughs> Some of them were shocking. Rob was just like, <laughs> um, but that was really, really cool. And you know, the demon is smart and it's intelligent but it's also um it's it's also sort of wrapped up in its own ego so that plays out so well on the page and that is all of bloody's expertise um what was really interesting to me were a few things one we don't get to know reagan uh as a normal little girl really we we, we only really get to meet her when she's possessed so it was really interesting. It was almost like he was protect protecting her identity or something. <laughs> the mother character is an interesting character because I never felt bad for her, like ever, like not once. Like I was never like, oh, you know, that's terrible, <laughs> you know, what she's going through because she's this woman of affluence and wealth and privilege. And, you know, she literally has everything at her fingertips and she has everything, all of these resources. You know, she owns oil and she owns stocks and she has cars and she also has this living staff. It's like a husband and wife from Sweden. They don't speak English very well, but she's always treating them like they're these annoying children, which is so not cool. <laughs> so I never felt bad for her. Um, it, it was kind of more watching her break down into just kind of this screeching, sobbing, reactionary mess. <laughs> Where she finally gets to this place of being, you know, completely not in control. The priest that comes and helps her is named Karas. I liked him the most. He, I think because he had these things that were going on that were interesting and also complex. He had this relationship with his mother, which was very kind of strained. He was struggling with his faith, um, you know, and he also lived in like this little room, like somewhere, you know, I don't know, a rectory or something, but he was very friendly with everybody and he was very dedicated to his work. And whenever anybody wanted something from him, he was, you know, willing to give it, let's say. There's also a detective who comes to talk to the mother and uh, he's really funny. 
he's one of these like he kind of like plays like the fool character or the clown character where his the way that he uses his, this type of social engineering is where he like he talks to you and he kind of acts like a like a fool like a buffoon but he's doing that specifically to get information from you. So he knows exactly what he's doing. So he is really interesting too. And also the writing, most specifically for the priest, was just gorgeous. It was just beautiful and touching. So I really liked the story. I think it, once we got past like the mom's life, which was just kind of like about her acting career and her friends and like all this kind of stuff. Once we got past all of that, we kind of started in on the possession and what was happening. That's when it got really, really interesting for me. Um, but I really liked it and enjoyed it. And I, now I just, I'm totally ruined. You ruined me, I'm ruined. Because I want every possession book or movie to have so much depth. So The Exorcist is a, really great example of how horror can be written in a serious manner where it takes itself seriously but because it can and because it should because it's honest you know like the book comes across like very very honest and I, I think that's like this, one of the striking things about The Exorcist it feels real it comes across as real it feels honest and that adds to the eeriness and to the horror and shock you know, that we find within it. So that was my review for Frozen Charlotte and The Exorcist. I hope that this video was useful to you. And if it was, please like and comment below. I would appreciate that so much. And if you want some more videos from me, please subscribe. Other than that, um, please look out for yourself, watch out for each other, and I will talk to you next time.